Um, welcome to our guests from outside the college. More, most importantly, this is absolutely thrilling. Thrilling. It's wonderful to have an open door here at Maine College of Art and Design and have folks walk through that door to have a partnership, have a, have a sort of a community comes in uh, and, 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 and meets. Um, it's wonderful. Um, today, uh, we're sitting in a research and inquiry class. Um, this is a freshman, a mandatory freshman class that links up studio practice with an academic portion. The class you're sitting in right now is entitled um, Acting Up, the History and Art of Modern American Social Movements. In that class, we have dealt to this point with three social movements. The Civil Rights Movement, uh, generally looking at the 1950s, 1960s, the anti-war movement, of course, of the 1960s and 70s, and the labor movement. Now, of course, the labor movement stretches for, for centuries. Uh, we have focused in this class on the efforts of the UFW, particularly the Delano Grape Strike in California, focusing most particularly on 65 to 70, just the very early 1970s. So in that effort, I turned to someone else because I know only a smidgen and I'm too young to have lived uh, that, that stuff. So we were lucky enough to, I was lucky enough to be introduced to Peter Kelman, uh, for whom I wish I, I had met in November when I was putting together this class. Peter, um, Peter's reti a retired, um, uh, lives in North Berwick, Maine with his wife where he tends his large garden. Um, Peter has a wealth of experience, um, and that which is pertinent to this class is at the age of 19, he was down in Selma, Alabama, marched in, uh, from Selma to Montgomery, and stayed on afterward to help put together a free library and volunteered uh, with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Um, he was also involved in the anti-war movement during the Vietnam War era, um, and in the 70s was part of the Clamshell Alliance uh, through which mass civil disobedience opposed the building of commercial nuclear power plants. Um, Peter, very involved in the labor movement and was president of the Shoe, uh, Shoe Workers Local 81, past director of the New Hampshire Committee on Occupational Safety Health, uh, and past chair of the main labor group on health. He was a steward for Painters Local 915 uh, and UFCW Local 1449. He has worked for the main AFL-CIO over the years in many capacities, most notable during the strike in J. Maine against the International Paper Company. And he also served on the main AF AFL-CIO's executive board and was the president of the Southern Maine Labor Council. Okay, he's written two books about labor, Divided We Fall, and Building Unions, and has taught labor history at USM, and has also taught labor history at Hartwood College of Arts. We have a fellow art professor here as well. Um, anyway, I just want to say, in addition, and Peter has been generous enough to also invite those he knows who have, as well, a wealth of experience inside the labor movement. I want to give a large round of applause for those folks joining us today. And I, I want to say just quickly to all, this is an opportunity that does not come around every day. Any itch you get to ask a question, make a comment, query anything, there is no, there is no excuse the expression, there are no stupid questions in here. Use this opportunity when we, when we arrive at, at question and answer to really get the most, um, the most out of it. Okay? Um, with that, Peter. Thank you. First, I want to start out by saying that uh, when I listen to all the things <clears throat> I've done, I must be at least 150. <laughs> I'm actually just 78. So it's, um, the other thing is um, I, I came, I've never been like on Vogue magazine or anything, but I did wear a uniform today. Um, <clears throat> this was the uniform of, of freedom fighters we called ourselves. Today they call us civil rights workers, um, except uh, I should have on combat, black combat boots. And there was a reason for this uniform. And it's one of the things that connects the civil rights and the, and the labor movement. That is, the civil rights workers, for the most part, wanted to show an identity with the working class. And I think that's one of the reasons why this uniform was adopted. Um, I always, it makes me smile today when I see kids that have dungarees with rips in them. It's like, it's a long way from someplace. Um, I'm going to try to just 
someone should stop me about half past, and then we can throw it open to questions on anything you want to ask me about. I'm happy to either deny or answer. So, so I want to start out with something called the solidarity clap. Um, if you're interested in, in, am I okay? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Is there anybody here who doesn't want to be videoed? Is that okay with everybody? Okay, so it's okay if you, if not, she would just focus on me, so. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Martha. Um, so one of the hardest things to do if you're trying to build a social movement, uh, especially a democratic social movement, is to get people to work together, right? Like, how do you do that? Um, I've spent my life thinking about that, and I'm not sure I can tell you everything about it, but one thing I've learned is you have to start someplace. And both in the labor movement and in the civil rights movement, we did what's called the solidarity clap, and I've always done that, as my friends will tell you, every time I meet them, in fact, or speak. Usually I won't even speak until I hear a solidarity clap. And usually when we give applause, we all applause at our own rate, right? And it's a it's fine, but when you applaud all at the same time, that's a, that's a show of unity. And it's a way to tell people that we have to start someplace if we want to act together. And although clapping may be a very simple thing, it can be very, very powerful. If you've ever been in a room or a building with 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 people or more and they're stomping their feet and clapping in unity, you can just feel the building move with that solidarity. So let's try it. Thank you, now I can speak. Um, first thing I want to talk about is the role that music plays in movements. It's very important. Have any of you seen the movie Selma? Anybody see Selma? Okay, I, I, I saw the movie, and for those of you who haven't seen it, it's, it's essentially a biography of King and what was going on in Selma at the time of the march. And a lot of the characters there in this movie were people that I were familiar with, some of them I knew, a few of them. Um, and it all, it all rang true to me, um, except for one thing. So who saw the movie? Is there anything you thought might have been missing in that movie? I don't remember it. Oh, okay. So there's no music. Um, I take that back. There's a scene in which Martin Luther King is on the phone one night, um, and Mahalia Jackson is singing to him. And there's some rap music in the background in a few places. And to me, that, although I thought it was a good movie, it missed the whole heart and soul of a struggle. Um, we sang all the time, all the time. Well, maybe not when we were sleeping. But basically, when you're in a struggle, one of the strengths, all your strengths are inner strengths and your relationship with others. And when you sing together, it just reinforces that. The other thing is that, <clears throat> like a lot of art in this country, what it's become it's become an individual thing. Like, we go someplace to listen to somebody entertain us or to sing, right? You go back to the early 1900s and before, music was something that people did. It wasn't entertainment the way we see it today. It wasn't focused on one person. Everybody sings. I remember the first time I was in uh, Glace Bay, Nova Scotia in the 1960s, which is a coal mining town um, in Cape Breton Island, way up at the end of Cape Breton Island, and you go to people's houses, and somebody brought out a fiddle or a guitar, and we sang. That, and they had a TV, but that was still there, that, that institution of music being something that's part of our soul, and it's not entertainment. Same thing has kind of happened with art. A lot of art I see today is valued by how much money it's worth. What an absurd fucking notion. Like, art is... That's how you judge art, by money. The, uh, <clears throat> you may recall, those of you that study art, the Mexican muralists. They believe that all art is public art. That's what I believe. 
There is no such thing as private art. But that's what it's become in our world today. It's like, oh, that's a great piece of art. It's, it's going to auction off at $300 million. But the real question is, what does that say to us? It isn't what it's, it's not the dollar amount, right? And music is the same thing, and it was in the Civil Rights Movement. One of the things John asked me to talk about was the connection between the labor movement and the Civil Rights Movement of the 60s. And so I went back to the 30s to the 60s. And you've all gotten, I hope, does anybody not get a copy of the music, the song, the lyrics? Or you can, if you get somebody next to you. Um, so I, I picked two, a song that's changed a little bit, but was used by both movements. And it's also used today. If you're involved in a struggle, this is a song that you can change to fit your struggle. That's the purpose of it. So it's, it's called Which Side Are You On? Are You On? Is anybody familiar with the song? Which side are you on? Which side are you on? OK. So it was um, in 1931, um, Florence Reist was at home with her family. Her husband wasn't there. He was an organizer, um, mine workers. And the goons came to get him. He had gone, so they harassed the family a little bit. And shortly thereafter, uh, Florence Re Reese wrote this song called Which Side Are You On? So shall we try it? Who's got, uh, who has sung it before? You've sung it before? Can you come up? Give us a hand. Why don't you start? All right. Everybody joins in. Come on, this is all of us now. <laughs> Come on, oh, you, you good, good workers. Good news to you, I'll tell of how the good old union has come in here to dwell. Which side are you on, boys? Which side are you on? My daddy was a miner. He's now in the air and sun. He'll be with you fellow workers until the day comes one. Which side are you on, boys? Which side are you on? They say in Holland County there are no neutrals there. You'll either be a union man or you'll fight for George McClare. Which side are you on, boys? Which side are you on? Oh, workers, can you stand it? Oh, tell me how you can. Will you be a lousy scab or will you be a man? Which side are you on, boys? Which side are you on? Don't stand up for the bosses. To listen to their lies. Both folks ain't got a chance unless they organize. Which side are you on, boys? Which side are you on? Can you stay here for a couple minutes? Yeah. So this was a song written by a woman whose home had just been invaded. And this was her response. It was through music. And actually, if you want to see her singing it, there's a really good labor movie, called, labor movie documentary called Harlan County. And um, I highly recommend the movie. It's about a strike in 1973. But in that movie, if I remember right, they actually have her as an old woman singing the song. It's pretty moving. So now we jump to the civil rights movement of the 60s. We pick up the same song. It's been changed slightly. When I went back to try to find a version for, of it, um, actually, can you go back to the original one that you had up here? The uh, picture of oh, yes. for this? Yes, yes. <coughs> nope. nope. For the class today, yeah. So this, if I'm not mistaken, is Lynn Chandler. And uh, he came up with a version for the Civil Rights Movement. Um, there was a group called the Freedom Singers that was part of SNCC. Um, when I went through the lyrics, I, it dawned on me that a lot of them wouldn't mean anything to you today. Um, there were a lot of references to things that I have to spend a lot of time. 
some I couldn't even figure out myself. So I, I picked out a few that uh, I thought might resonate more today. But I want to stress one thing about this music. This music is your music. It's our music. It's anybody who struggles music. And so you should be free to change it to fit your own circumstances. Now, for example, the one we just sang that was written in 1931 was written in a very male-oriented society, right? And so they used the term boys in 1931. Well, if you use it today, you might change that lyric, right? Also, in the Civil Rights Movement, you'll see that the chorus has changed a little bit. And that's also the same thing. And in the labor, more recent labor movement, um, we've also changed it. We use it differently. Um, but I'm using this as an example. So let's try the next one. You start. Yeah. Come on, All you freedom fighters, the story I will tell. Back down in prison is a lonesome jail cell. Which side are you on? 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 I want to hear you. Sorry. I want to. Okay. It's okay, just skip to the next one. Come all you Uncle Tom's, Tom's take, take the hanky from your head. Forget your fears and shed a tear for the life of shame you've led. Then tell me which side are you on? Which side are you on? I want to know now which side are you on? Which side are you on? You're gonna Tom for Mr. Charlie, you're gonna listen to his lies. Cause the color colored folk, we ain't got a chance unless we organize. Everybody now, which side are you on? 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 Are you, on? you need not join the picket line if you can't stand the blows. But join your dimes and dollars, or be counted with our foes. You better tell me now, which side are you on, boys? Which side are you on? I really want to know now, which side are you on? Which side are you on? Thank you. Give yourself up. It's all right here class. So just a small note on the differences between the two. You'll notice in the second one, because it was, uh, that's, was sung by people in the black community, um, there's also like a call and response that you can see in that chorus that you don't see in the first one. So you can see how some change has taken place depending on who's singing it for whom. Um, next thing I wanted to talk about was, uh, So I was in Selma, um, I, I turned 19 in Selma, Alabama, and uh, I came down there after uh, Reverend Reeb was murdered, and I remember walking on the street where he was murdered and the blood was, was still in the sidewalk. Um, I went back there 50 some years later and couldn't find the blood anymore, but uh, the place is still there where people came out and murdered him. Um, but on the march, uh, I didn't march. Um, it was 200 people, basically, that did the whole march. I was assigned with a crew of 50 seminarians and a Hollywood celebrity I was in charge of to put up and take down the tents. And so every morning we left Selma and uh, took down tents and put up tents and moved people's belongings who were on the march. A couple of things that uh, I think are really relevant today. If you go back and look at those pictures, you will see people that looked dressed very, uh, excuse me, they looked the same, but they were dressed very differently. They didn't have fancy hiking shoes. They didn't have raincoats. And it rained and rained. It was wet that whole trip. In fact, when we put up the tents on a couple of the, or a couple of the places where we put tents up, um, we had to 
put straw down and then plastic on top of that because people slept on the ground. They say it was raining a lot, and if you look at the pictures, you'll see that people, a lot of people didn't have raincoats. They just used plastic, just sheets of plastic. That's how they stayed dried. It was so wet that um, on the Sunday after the wa march, when I got back to where I was staying in Selma, the actual um, soles of my feet, all the skin came off. All that heavy stuff just came off because my feet had been wet, so wet. Um, the reason I'm talking about this is because today we assume so many material things are needed to live and to be an activist, and it's all crap. Um, we didn't get paid. I mean, SNCC staff got, I think it was $10.22 $10 or something every two weeks for field staff. Um, and I was a volunteer, so I didn't get paid at all. And so the way we survived was, we used to call it organizing breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So if I went to your house in the morning, I would just be hoping that you would invite me in for breakfast. And then when I went for lunch, I was hoping you'd invite me in for lunch. And I'd hope you'd invite me in for supper. Um, and that's how we organized. Also, I did a lot of that in the anti-war movement, too. I would go to different college campuses. I remember doing this in Maine and New Hampshire. And uh, this was before there were any kind of real organization set up for communication. And I, would, and I would go to the bulletin board in a campus, and I'd look for something like a coffee house, you know, whatever. And then I'd go find those people, and pretty soon somebody put me up. And if I was lucky, someone would drive me to the next campus. Um, that's how we worked. And that's how you work when you believe in something. That's the most important thing to you. We also didn't have telephones. Uh, to speak of. Um, people had their in, the, in their homes. Long distance calls were extremely expensive. And SNCC had what was called a Watts line at the time, where they would pay a lot of money so they could call anybody, things that we just take for granted now, you just call somebody any place. We couldn't do that. We'd have to, you know, if someone was in jail or some big problem was happening, you would call the Watts line um, and it was a return call so that you didn't pay for it. And you'd have to say enough so they'd know and they could call you back. That, that was it. I mean, um, you didn't just pick up a phone and make a call if you're in someone's house because it was a long distance call. It would be very expensive. And not everybody had telephones. Anyways, um, jump ahead a little bit. After, after Selma in the 1990s, I worked for a... Uh, organization called the Corporations for, on, on Corporations and Democracy, POCLAD. And it was the first time in my life I got to actually read and study and write. And what the organization was looking at was the history of corporate power on this continent. And I was the one that looked at it from a working class point of view. So it was somewhat different than my colleagues. Um, and one of the things I spent a lot of time studying was the Populist, the Farmers Alliance of the 1880s, 1890s, which was very interesting. Now fast forward to around 2015, um, I was on Maine Call-In, which is a, you know, I don't know if any of you ever heard it, but uh, it's on uh, public broadcasting at noontime during the week. And Jennifer Rooks is the uh, person usually asking the questions. And we were talking about the march from Selma to Montgomery. And uh, she asked me this question. She said, what did you remember about the speech that Martin Luther King gave <laughs> in Montgomery? And uh, <clears throat> I, was, I had to look at her and look around and admit the truth. I didn't remember anything about that speech, not a word. Um, now, I have good excuses. I was a marshal that day, and I was at the very back of the march, and there's like 25,000 people. I'm sure the sound system wasn't good. Um, but anyways, I don't remember hearing anything. And so after the show, I went home and I read that speech. And it was, it's pretty profound. There are, that's one of his, there are two of King's speeches, well, there's actually three, I better stop there, um, that I recommend, and that's one of them. The other one is the last speech he gave before he died in uh, Memphis, Tennessee. Um, and 
the beauty of his speeches to me, um, getting away from the populist thing for a minute, is that if you, if you read that speech or listen to it uh, in, in Memphis, so he's talking to sanitation workers, right? Garbage collectors and their families and their friends and their community, right? But what does he talk about? He gives a history lesson that begins about 4,000 years ago. And the reason he does that is so people can see themselves as players in history. They can understand where they came from and then possibly from that where they're going. We see very little of that today. I hear people give all kinds of speeches and they never really place the people they're talking to in this timeline of ours, this history. And so that's you know, one of the things to learn from that. Get back to the Montgomery speech. He started talking about the populist and it kind of blew me away, having studied it. Remember, I, I didn't hear the speech to begin with. Then in the 1990s, I get to study the populace. And then in 2015, I'm finally listening to the speech he gave in 1965. And so why would that seem strange to me that he was talking about the populist movement? Anybody want to take a crack at it? It's very, very important. Very important, because the populists were racist. To join the populist party, you had to be white. I'm sorry, the Farmers Alliance, you had to be white. So why would Martin Luther King, many years later, he's speaking to 25,000 people in a national audience, and he points to the populists as being very important and how we should look at them. Why would he do that? They're racist, no question about it, hands down. They're also working class. Now, you're probably familiar with the fact that during Reconstruction, there were a lot of African Americans elected to office in the Deep South, right? Who are their allies? The populists. See, the populists may not, as, a, as an organization, may have been racist. But more important to them as working class people was how to use politics to advance your goals. So you go into coalitions. See, today people talk about coalitions. It's like, oh, yes, this organization signed on, this organization signed on. That's all bullshit. A real coalition, you have to give up something. It's a very important part of understanding what a coalition is. If you're not giving up something, you're not in a coalition, right? It's not the fact that all of us organizations agree on something. The question is, what are we giving up to fight for something that we all agree on? And that's the point I think King was making with the populace. Um, and it's, it's really important. And I, at the time of the Civil Rights Movement, one of the roles of the FBI was to make sure that there were no alliances between blacks and whites in the Deep South. And the way they did that was they made us scared. We were scared for good reason, because some of our brothers and sisters had gotten murdered, and we all figured, well, we might be next. And so who wouldn't you talk to? You wouldn't talk to anybody white. And so we never had the opportunity to actually try to do that kind of organizing. And when I reflect on that, I want to tell you, well, I'll tell you this one story, and then I'll ask, open it up for questions. So I was working in Sumter County in early 1966, and uh, on, we were trying to build these independent countywide political parties in Alabama, which you probably know of from the term black power, because that's where it came from, the Black Panther parties of Alabama. And so one, after, one Sunday afternoon, now I'm almost 20 years old, <clears throat> I wasn't old enough to drink, I was old enough to be drafted, but I couldn't vote, right? Anyways, the guy I was working with, Stu House, is an African-American, and it's Sunday afternoon, and we went to visit a friend who lived behind a sawmill in Sumter County. And we're out there drinking moonshine and had a little fire going, and, and the guy that we're with is a nice guy. He worked at the a sawmill, also obviously an African-American. There's no road into his house. The only way he'd get there is through the woods or come through the, uh, come through the sawmill. 
And Stu and I had come through the woods because that was the safe way for us to travel. And uh, so we're sitting down, drinking, enjoying the fire, enjoying the day, kind of leaving all our worries behind. And this white guy comes over, he comes out of the sawmill and comes toward us. Now the guy we were with said, oh, he's okay, he's okay. But Stu and I, we, we weren't buying it. We were scared to death. We had just had a friend murdered. We didn't, you know, it's like, whoa. Um, uh, Jonathan Daniels, I think. Anyways, um, the guy's trying to be friendly. Here's this white guy. Here's two black guys and a white guy sitting there around a fire, you know. Should have been fine, but Stu and I, first of all, we were scared because we had been drinking. Um, we weren't armed. We didn't know anything about this guy. And uh, it's a terrible situation, right? I mean, what's the problem? Is this guy wants to be friendly. Well, this is what he notices that we're not very comfortable. He doesn't sit down. And he looks at us, uh, Stu and I, and he says this, trying to calm us down. He said, I come from a long line of Republicans. Now, I didn't know much history then, but I knew something. I knew about the Dixiecrats. And what he was trying to tell us was we're not all alike. We're not all alike. And Stu and I, we still weren't buying it. We were, <laughs> and he sensed that, and he just, he just left. But suppose that fear wasn't there. Suppose we had had a conversation. Maybe we'd be living in a different world today. Anyways, enough of that. Um, did any of you get to read my freedom history memories? Memo memories? I don't know if you got Anyways, I'll open it up to questions. And I may get some help here from my friends in the labor movement. So. Yeah? In the labor movement? Um, I th uh, some people point to that as being the beginning of the, uh, in beginning of the organizing of public sector, sector workers in, in the South, especially. Um, I was living in exile at the time, so I, I can't tell you. Uh, I didn't really get involved in organized labor until um, 1975, so it was a few years, seven years later. So I don't know. Um, the movie um, At the River I Stand, well, is, have you ever, you know the movie At the River I Stand? It's about, it's about Memphis. And uh, it's probably the best movement on labor and civil rights that I can think of. Um, and it exposes a lot, of, a lot of things, a lot of the problems in, in both movements. But it also shows you, um, well, it's interesting to me that, so Martin Luther King is killed not as a civil rights worker, but when he goes to help lead a strike. Um, we have a Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy is murdered when he starts making connections and starts talking about the working class, he gets murdered. Um, the first strike, major strike in the United States um, was in 1877, the great upheaval. And there were 200 uh, strikers are murdered by federal troops. Uh, I won't go on and on. I, I will mention one more thing about um, the connections I'm trying to make about with populism, and that is that um, at some point I became interested in, when I had the time to do it, researching the history of lynching. And uh, there's been a lot of work done since on that, but at the time the, uh, you would have to go to the Tuskegee Institute and they kept a list of lynchings. Um, and it kind of blew me away when I got into it, because guess who they lynched first to end Reconstruction? They lynched, they lynched white people first. Before they lynched black people, they lynched white people. And why was that? It makes total sense. If you want to defeat these racist populists who are now in alliance with African Americans, you better kill the whites first, because it's easier. And that sends a message to the white community that don't be talking to those black people, right? Then you kill the black people to make sure they stay subservient. But first, you break the alliance. That's what's key. You break the alliance first, and that's what they did. And that's why, if you go to the statistics, 
you'll see that the first people lynched were the whites. They didn't have to do too many of them. The message got across pretty quick. That's how lynching works, right? OK, you can press. I think they always come together, but <laughs> uh, the high point to me was, well, there were many, but uh, the strike in Jay and the mass meetings we had every Wednesday night where the 1,500 people came. We all sang, held hands, rocked back and forth, sang Solidarity Forever. Um, we sang that initially at the end of the meeting, then at the beginning of the meetings, and then at the end and the beginnings of the meetings. So uh, uh, one other comment about movements is that People move, right? The word actually says a lot about what a movement is. So when you sing, hand, hold hands and sing, you move, right? You rock back and forth. You're moving. You're part of a movement. Somebody else? Yes? Uh, when we were talking about um, how Martin Luther King was talking about uh, the populist movement, yep. um, was that because their way of organization was the same as what the civil rights were trying to do? No, uh, this is my opinion. I, yeah. I, I think that um, what he was trying to say was, the reason I told the story about the sawmill is that we have a history in this. Well, um, are you familiar with the Free Soil Party? Anybody? Free Soil, that was the party that Lincoln came out of to form the Republican Party. And in this movie, I was talking about Lincoln, um, which I thought, well, I didn't talk about Lincoln yet, but so ha who's seen the movie Lincoln? You've seen it? Anybody else? All right, you've seen it. So it was supposed to be about essentially the 13th and 14th Amendments and, and how they came to be. And uh, I thought it was not a very good historical um, movie mainly because it talked about, it's like that the abolitionists brought us the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Um, and in my study of that period of time, that wasn't true at all. Um, the abolitionists are important, but it was actually the Free Soilers. So the Free Soil Party um, said that you don't have to believe, basically, they were also you know, racist in a way. They didn't you didn't have to be for integration. You didn't have to believe that African Americans were equal or smart or anything like that, right? They were against slavery because they had to compete with slave labor. It's very important, right? And they become the Republican Party and, uh, through Lincoln. And so <clears throat> in this movie, they never talk about the Free Soil Party, right? It's not mentioned, not mentioned. Um, they only talk about the abolitionists. There's one line in the movie in which Lincoln is quoted as saying basically what I just said. He, he says that, you know, my father didn't believe that blacks were equal to whites. Not the exact words, but that's basically it. However, he was against slavery because we had to move three times because we couldn't compete with save slave labor. You know, ask yourself the question, why did so many people from Maine, boys and men from Maine, go and fight in the Civil War? Because they believed, many of them, that it wasn't just chattel slavery, but wage slavery would end too. See, they opposed wage slavery. So they go basically into coalitions. And that's why <clears throat> it was so important for him to talk about the populace because he's talking about the potential of creating coalitions. Um, and so after Memphis, what is, I'm not, <clears throat> basically after Selma, um, starts working on the class question with the Poor People's Campaign. He wanted to go into coalitions with other people, not just to support African Americans, but to support all working people in the country. Do you have a follow up? Or For a second, I thought it was because the, uh, perhaps the populist movement 
kind of organized itself before the civil rights, and then it was like, as an example of that, that's how they came up. But like the way of organizing <laughs> that group was that, but no, it's more so um, about organizing a bit larger groups than. I think it's about. Don't be afraid to go into a coalition with somebody that may not even think you're a human being to begin with. <laughs> I mean, I'm over. I'm making the case strong, but I think that's it. Peter, you mind if I? You mind if I sure. Just yeah, sure. It. So the other thing that King probably is doing at that point is see Van Woodward had published uh, the Strange Career of Jim Crow in 1955, I think. In that book, he he hints at the popular imagine the, the, sort of our, the, the popular notion that after Reconstruction, it was effectively just the lynching of black folk and white folk were all a bunch of racists in the South. Right. There was this moment that C. Van Woodward talks about between 1877 and effectively Mississippi's new constitution in 1890, when there was what was called fusion politics and uh, working in tandem, Republicans, populists, farmers alliance was a little bit earlier, but black and white were willing to work together. As, it, as Peter mentioned, the real concern of kind of the bourbon class or the or the or the aristoc the sort of white aristocracy in the South was we got to stop this working class, we got this partnership between black and white. And they were able to figure out a way to do that. The populists come in the early 1890s through a guy named Tom Watson becomes a virulently racist uh, party. But but Woodward, who's writing about 10 years before, 15 years before King makes that speech, is talking about this actually kind of this moment where there was a new South that could have come to be through working class politics. And so King is reinvoking those kind of 18, late 1870s, 1880s, the moment that Woodward is talking about in that book. Um, it's a really important, it's a really important book and we forget about it. We oftentimes think just Reconstruction ends and black folk are lynched and that's the end of that. Um, Woodward changes our mind. The other part of the history that's missing, and I think he may even mentions Woodward in the speech, I'm, but. And we all, read, everybody in the Civil Rights Movement, we read that book, um, among other books. Um, so there's this whole thing of, like, how did race come to be in the United States or in the colonies? How did it come to be? Anybody want to expound on that? I know you could, but I won't uh, ask you. My memory there, because Virginia is 17th century, but we talked about a first semester. Remember those laws? Anti-miscegenation laws. Six, Sixteen seventy. Sixteen hundreds. The the child will follow the uh, the condition of the mother, not the father. Oh, no. oh man! That's all right. Keep reading the Rome Bennett Jr. <laughs> so, just I'll make this really quick. It deserves several courses, but I'll I'll try to condense it. Um, in Europe, when Europeans started to colonize. Uh, the Americas, most people lived in conditions they were unfree. They were slaves. Most people. That's how they lived. That was the nature of the society they lived in. You were tied to the land. You couldn't just leave. You couldn't just walk around. Now, I'm just talking about white people now, okay? The different conditions of unfree labor, different l levels of it. But basically, Ireland, you, the Irish it was illegal for them to learn how to read, right? Um, in Scotland, I think it was 1699, the parliament passed a law which stated that vagabonds, which are people walking around who are not tied to the land the way they're supposed to be, right, just walking around, um, could be picked up by the owners of the collieries, the mines, and made slaves. They became the property of the mine. And in Edinburgh, they had a slave market, a white slave market. What happened in this continent was, and the reason that race becomes associated with slavery in most people's minds in this country, certainly was with me growing up, was you started to have this coalition again between the indentured white servants, slaves, right? The difference between an indentured servant and, a, and what we call slaves today is one is chattel and one is bonded. One is for life and one is for a period of time. That's the only difference. The conditions are the same. Um, the punishments are different for different reasons. But anyways, um, I digress. So we started to have revolts where whites and black slaves 
we were working together. And you had to stop that. And one way to stop that was to start passing laws which basically made African, peoples of African descent property and they're black. And they stopped doing the same thing to the whites essentially so the whites could be used to control their black brothers and sisters. <clears throat> Came out of a rebellion. That's why that was set up that way. And so when I was growing up, <clears throat> I was in Salem, New Hampshire in probably the third grade. Uh, we actually had, it was a two-room schoolhouse with eight grades in it. Um, and so there were 40 kids in each classroom and each, each teacher had a lot of different subjects to do. And I remember we were doing something about uh, history. Or, and I remember this book we had. And it had a picture of a, a black woman in a cotton field. And she had her child with her. And there's a big in the middle of a cotton field, and she's dragging this big bag, right? And she's facing the camera, and a kid's facing the camera, and the caption was something about colored woman and piccaninny. Uh, child is referred to as a piccaninny. Um, and I remember our teacher, and they have these pasted smiles on their face. And I'll never forget the picture. And I remember that our teacher said, started talking about um, I remember she used the word colored people and Negroes, but it was one of the two. And she said, they're very happy, they're very musical, and she went on along that vein. And that went into my brain. Fast forward, I'm at a party of SNCC workers in Alabama, and up until that point, in the back of my brain someplace, I think, I believe this myth that all people can, all black people can sing and dance. It came from what was stuck in my mind, right? And it stayed there. I mean, here I am, a civil rights worker living in a black community, and it's still there, but I don't know that until I'm at this party, and I see this black guy that can't sing or dance. And all of a sudden, the synapses in my brain exploded because I realized how deep, how deep what that teacher told me had gone. The important thing to remember here is what the teacher, not what she said, but what she didn't say. She didn't say that African Americans are inventors and doctors and lawyers, that they have potential to do things that everybody else does. And so what you're left with is the negative, right? I'm left with the stereotype, and it's deep in my brain. And I was probably in the fourth grade. And so it wasn't until a number of years later that it exploded. And, I, it, and then I began to realize the significance of what she said was what she didn't say, right? Because that framed the question. And so that's what I was left with from the third or fourth grade until I was probably 20 years old. Anyways, I can't remember the question I was trying to answer or if it matters. Anybody else? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit, so you were like uh, 17, 18 when you like left home and were organizing the SNCC. Can you talk about like how you got involved, or sure. correct me if I'm wrong, and then talk no, no. about how you got involved in this. So um, I went to the University of Maine in Arno in 1963 from Sanford High School, and my passion at the time was playing football. It's maybe hard for you to believe looking at me now, but I actually played the line in the Yankee Conference. Anyways, um, but things were changing. I was reading the papers, and uh, I used to say I read Newsweek and Time to get both sides. Um, and you don't even know what Newsweek and Time is, do you? Sorry. Um, anyways, um, there's a lot going on, and um, I wanted to be part of it. I left school, and um, I'll, I'll skip a few months. But it basically, I ended up uh, being against the war and working for the Committee for Nonviolent Action in Voluntown, Connecticut. We went around protesting the war and speaking about the war and for peace. And um, after Bloody Sunday, there was a call for people to come down to uh, Selma, and the Committee for Nonviolent Action sent me down. Have any of you seen the movie Rustin lately? Rustin? No? You seen? Yeah. I won't tell the story then. It's OK. So that's how I got to Selma. Um, I took a bus down by myself and uh, got, to, got into Selma. And I asked somebody, um, obviously an African American, how do I get to Brown's Chapel Church from the bus station? Because I had no idea. 
And that was my first kind of experience in, in how do civil rights workers survive. And so the person I asked said, OK, I know where you're going if you're asking me that question, basically. And she said, so you want to stay away, you want to stay on the streets that black people use and white people don't use as much. <laughs> and so she gave me directions to the, and that's how I got there and, and alive, I guess. Um, anyways, and that's a short answer. I could go on the labor movement. Uh, I got involved in that while I was working at Converse Rubber in North Berwick in 1975, and we tried to organize a union. We would be pretty bad. Um, but the important part of it is we had a strong committee, and they, they ended up closing Converse Rubber, and it didn't last that long. And some of the people that were on the union organizing committee went to work at Laconia Shoe, which was a union shop in Sanford. They soon, start, they soon were running the local, and they said, Peter, you need to come. So I went and worked in an injection molding machine, and that's how I get into uh, organized labor in that sense. Peter, could you jump, sure. uh, jump back to, to 60, 65? Would you walk through some of these? When would you say? What did, these, what did the meetings look like? And I mean, we've got the impre right, Good point. Got the, this that hold, the hand holding. Could you walk us through some of some of what it looked like to meet sure. in, in, in some? Yep. Well, before the march, there were meetings every night. Um, at Brown's Chapel Church, and, um, and someone once asked me what did I learn the first week. I said, I learned how to clap, literally. I learned how to clap because we just clapped and sang, um, and my hands were raw. Um, and then a few weeks later, bottoms of my soles fall off, from, not from clapping. But anyways, um, so you'd walk into a hall, and it, there'd be some speeches, but mainly people would sing, I mean, just sing. I, um, one of the first demonstration I was on in Selma, um, actually did this in a class in, in the Portland Middle School. Um, so they, they had what was called the Berlin Wall. There was an injunction and we couldn't march out of the black community, out of the, actually the projects, the black projects in Selma. And uh, <laughs> so my first demonstration there was they got people together, it was probably four or five hundred of us, and they said, okay, we're all going to go two by two, and we're going to march up to the Berlin Wall, which was sheriffs and et cetera, and they're going to stop us. Now, we started singing when we went to Brown's Chapel Church. We sang right up until they stopped us, and then we kept singing. But, um, so they kept us there, and then the plan was the back half would break, break off and head in another direction, and then they would get stopped. Then the first group and the second group would break up again. Now there's, you know four of us. I did this at the middle school. It was exciting. I think we had, I had all the kids singing and walking through the school. And I was playing the sheriff, so I'd stop them. And they'd stop and they'd break up. Anyways, that's when I learned it's, especially in middle schools, it's worthless to give a lecture. You just do a demonstration, right? Everybody had a good time. Not only that, at that school, everybody in the school now knows what's going on because here are these kids singing, walking around the classrooms and raising hell, kind of, basically. Um, so, how did it actually feel? Um, it felt great <laughs> um, to be around people that are so excited. And also, I consider myself a revolutionary. And to me, that was what was going on. And so the people actually trying to change what at the time I thought was some of the fundamental underpinnings of our society. Um, keep in mind, what was, the, what was the title of the 1963 March in Washington? It's key. It's key to all this, right? So jobs, jobs and justice. It was the economic question was first. But that kind of gets lost for a while until um, after Selma and, and you begin with the Poor People's Campaign. SNCC had also shifted to class-oriented organizing um, in, in the black community. Um, for example, when I was, um, I'm kind of getting a little bit away from your question, but um, I was, we were doing a work, SNCC was doing a workshop for the black, what became known as the Black Panther. But, oh, interesting thing. Why did they come up with the Black Panther? Who knows? Anybody think? I know you probably don't know. It's a rhetorical question, I guess. It's very interesting, though. The reason they came up with the Black Panther was, does anybody know what the symbol of the Democratic Party in Alabama was at the time? 
who was the white rooster, also known as a white cock. So if you're illiterate and you go to vote, there are symbols. And so you have the Black Panther and the white cock. And that's, that was one of the underpinnings of, coming, of using the Black Panther as a... <coughs> Anyways, I was doing this, I was part of a workshop we were doing at the SNCC office from people that come in from a number of the counties to be trained, it was a training for, um, for the independent political county parties, uh, Black Panther parties. And so the question is, well, why should we be in the black, you know, why should we do this? Why shouldn't we just go with the Democratic Party? And um, my role at the time, what I had to talk about turned out to be my future because it was about labor. And so I said, well, the reason that you need to elect the sheriff and the county tax collector is, the tax collectors have been taking your land away from you. And the sheriff is making sure that you can't, you can't organize a union. In fact, there was an organizing drive at the time in Selma at the Coke plant. See, the sheriff keeps you from organizing. The tax collector takes away your land. Both true. Well, you want to change that? Make sure the tax collector and the sheriff represent you, and you need a party to do that. And so that was, that's what I talked about. Peter, um, yes. Can you tell me the difference between, in the 60s, a man and a woman? How many women were in your movement? I mean, certainly we were supporters, Yeah. but, but were given the chance to do what you did. Actually, in SNCC, there, there was a fair number. SNCC was pretty open to that. Um, there's this whole thing. I'm sorry. It was the only one. Yeah, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Um, it wasn't that, that sexism wasn't rampant. It was. But there were also women in leadership. And actually, the beginnings of the feminist movement of the 70s actually came out of a paper that some white women in SNCC wrote. Um, it's always interesting. I knew Stokely Carmichael fairly well. And, uh, he was, he uh, historically has been kind of accused of a statement that in fact he made that the role of women is under men or something like that, which he said as a joke, but it was picked up as not being a joke. Um, everybody knew him, knew that if anybody was not in believing something like that, it was Stokely. Um, and it was true. Um, so the tensions were, were there, there was no question about it. And, they were, and there was a lot of not good stuff that went on. But given the nature of SNCC, you, you were, it was a place where you could talk about those things and actually do something about it. So it was a question that was often talked about. But in terms of the roles of men and women generally in the movement, especially in SELC, which was basically a Baptist organization that was very hierarchical, it was much more obvious. But there were women that worked, for, worked there too. Um, is that a fair answer? Or? Sure, well, and right. I just compare your life to my life. Yeah. I certainly was supportive of all these movements. Yeah. But I had kids. Yeah. I had a job. A uni job. But, yeah. I was expected to be yes. the mother. Well, and also to take the notes and run the mimeograph machine. Mm -hmm. Well, absolutely. Yeah. The shit work, we'd call it. Basically. Yes. Uh -huh. You have a question? thoughts about the labor movements of today, especially when there's these really big corporations putting a lot of like pressure and fear onto their employees to not organize? That uh, Historically, that has always been the case in the United States of America. Um, and uh, it's actually at times been a lot worse than it is now. Um, it's the nature of the class conflict, and, and that hasn't, hasn't changed. Um, there have been a lot of changes in the kind of work we do and how we do that. But um, the big changes to me in the labor, in, in labor, um, I don't even consider, I don't think we even have a labor movement today. We have some small labor movements, but overall we don't, we don't have a movement. And, and uh, there isn't really time to get into it in this class, but it's, it's really good when I hear a lot of people talking about movements and I ask them to define a movement, and it becomes very hard because the word is used almost universally for any time some people do something that opposes something, it's called a movement. Um, and that's not my definition, but um, actually a good definition of what a movement is, 
uh, if you read the Populist Moment, Populist Moment by uh, Lawrence Goodwin, he gives the best definition um, that I've seen of what a movement is. Um, but ask me a question again. I'm sorry, I, I lost track talking. Oh, I was, uh, how do you feel about the labor movements of today, considering that a lot of big corporations put a lot of pressure and fear and threats actually right on the workers, especially with like the or especially like organizations like Amazon and Tesla. Or U.S. Steel, and uh, you go back a ways, right? Um, the difference, I think, today is that it's mainly with, and a large part of it has to do with workers' consciousness. There's very little class consciousness in this country. It's, it's starting to show up. I, I told someone, I'm a member of the UAW, and I said, I'm so glad to finally hear a president of a national union talking about the working class instead of the fucking middle class, right? Um, I think what's new today, well, first of all, the tactics have changed to be effective without violence. So what we faced is uh, a labor movement going all the way back to the 1600s um, was violence, just unmitigated violence. Um, they just killed people. And that extends up until pretty recent history. I mean, in the 1930s, we had organization of, um, it's called the Tenant Farmers Workers Union. And what they found was that if they didn't arm themselves, they couldn't have meetings because they just were killed. That's in the 1930s. Obviously, I, I could talk more, I'm not going to, but about the people that were killed in the civil rights movement and in the anti-war movement in the 60s. People forget about that. Um, but people were murdered. Um, and it goes on and on. I don't know. Um, I wish I could stay longer. I, I can't stay long today because my wife's stuck at the airport right now with a bad cold, and I need to pick her up <laughs> and bring her home. So um, I'm, if it's OK, I'm happy to come back if you want me at some time. But um, I'm going to have to go. And, but I'll take one more question if that's OK. Yeah. Ooh, you had a question? Was there another student? I, I didn't see. Anybody else raise their hand? Just to speak to that last question, I sure. wanted to get some hot tips. Like, given that we're in a totally like tech data collection like nightmare, like, you know, dystopian hellscape um, in terms of like, and additionally, the state just has a, essentially a monopoly on violence when it comes to crowd control in terms of like, you know, and how that integrates. This is like a big question, but with like Second Amendment and like the John Brown Society and like being armed as a means of resistance against the ruling class. Like, any like offline hot tips for organizing? Like, I mean, obviously. Well, I think like, offline is the, like is the codes, key right there. Actually. Like, I don't know, offline. like secret maps. I mean, I just I have thoughts about that. There aren't any secrets. In fact, I, in my entire life, one thing I learned is that when I organize, there are no secrets. You have to speak the truth. And another time, I'll tell you a story about speaking truth to power. But essentially, to me, what that means, speaking truth to power, is that we speak the truth to each other to, so we can generate the power that we have to work together. And the most key thing in organizing, most key thing is establishing trust. And if you can do that on an in, in the internet, good. Do it on the internet. I don't know if it's possible. But people have to get to know people. That's how you, you can't build a movement unless you really trust the people that you work with. They got to have your back. You got to have their back. You got to be willing to die for each other. Otherwise, there won't be no movement that can take on the powers that we have always taken on. That's, there's nothing new about how control is exercised by a ruling class. Tactics change over time. But basically, it's all based on the, the bottom line is violence. That's what they got. And violence. And what we have is each other. So anyways, I'm sorry to take off, but um, 
Maybe you can keep the discussion going for a little yes, while. For I don't sure, know. For sure, we have to. We, exactly. We, we do have ten minutes. Uh, I'd love to. I'd love to keep keep folks around if folks wish. Yeah. To oh yes, yeah. so we have other labor people here. You can ask questions to. Fantastic. Um, but Peter, thank you so much. Thank well, you're so welcome. We do it together. Again? Let me get more. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be in touch with you. Okay. Sorry to leave you guys. Bye. We'll see you next week. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Take care, everybody. Yep. Yep. I'm sorry. Thank you. Oh, God. I almost walked away with your. <laughs> Thank you. Take care. Thank you. How did you run meetings? I'm the president. How did you, you run meetings? Yeah. My name is Doris Bowen. I'm the former national president of the American Postal Workers Union. And uh, we always start the meeting with a song. Because for some reason, the song unites us. And our favorite song is always Solidarity Forever. And we've sung it for years. In 1970, the Postal Service decided that we were getting paid too much. So in 1970, for the first time in history, we went on strike. Well, we can't strike a federal agency. That's what they told us. So we didn't strike. We sat down. All the postal officers said, oh, the workers were there. They just weren't doing it. Why? Our livelihoods were being challenged by people in Congress who are in $300 suits telling me that my $5 an hour job was too much. I was getting paid too much. We decided to sing. We sang in the post office. Then they decided to send in the National Guard. They were going to sort the mail. So every post office had the National Guard there. Well, 93% of the National Guard were postal workers. So that went over a little bit less than they had hoped. <laughs> um, it became UCIC, which happens now, in everything that's happening with the union movement right now. I'm the big government. We're not going to change. Well, when 33,000 postal workers sit down on the job, Things had to change. We're going through it again right now. For those of you who don't know, they're trying to consolidate the Postal Service. They're actually trying to bring the plant from Hamden, Maine. You know where Hamden is up by Bangkok? Mm -hmm. Down to Portland, the South of Scarborough, actually. And what's going to happen? If I live in Fort Kent and my medicine leaves my doctor's office in Fort Kent, and has to go to me, who lives in Port Kent, it has to come here to be sorted. By truck, not by plane, because they don't have airports big enough to send planes up there. So does that make any sense at all? Why would it take five days for something to go from Forest Avenue to Cumberland Avenue is what it is. So again, the Postal Service is trying to implode. It's trying to destroy itself from within. And the reason it's doing that is because we are very profitable in some areas and less profitable in other areas. The ones we're less profitable in are the areas where we work. For the low-income people, where we deliver to low-income areas, where someone says, well, UPS will take over. Well, that plant in Hamden, you can go there any day of the week, and the UPS trucks are backed up to our platforms, and they're taking the stuff off their trucks and putting them on mail trucks, because UPS doesn't go to northern Maine in a lot of areas. The roads are bad. We have one place in, in northern Maine that you have to drive the, the carrier drives to Canada to come back into the town into the town that has to deliver to. UPS isn't going to do that. 
So we're going through right now what you're talking about back in the 60s. It's starting all over again. So what we need to do is flood Congress. Let him get the Postmaster General out of there because his job when he became a Postmaster General was to get rid of the post office. That was his job. And I don't know how many of you are Democrats and how many of you are Republicans. I don't know you. But Trump put him in there to do just that, to get rid of the post office. Because the thing that they didn't realize is Congress years ago put us as part of the Constitution. So it's very difficult to get us out completely. So they'll give us the mail that we can't make money at or we can't keep living but they'll take the mail away that makes money that keeps us going. And remember, if a postal worker gets a raise, it does not come out of your tax dollars. So you can say what you want, but when somebody says, I pay your pay, no, you don't. Can the I, revenues pay the pay. Can I ask, can I throw the, the question that was on the table to you all, when does a movement start? When do we have? When does a when, when do we have a movement? When 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 do you feel like? And that, that could be a that could be a small that could be around a particular issue, or that could be more broadly. I love opinions around around the table about when a movement starts. When we know we're in a movement. We're in a movement right now. And why? And, and we know. And you know that you're confident about that because I'm very confident because we put we are postal workers. Mm. We have letter carriers. We have maintenance. We have people at the Southern Maine Labor Council. We have people working at the AFL-CIO. We have the Citizens Unite. Uh, Citizens Unite, good grief. We, we have, um, oh, what's the, there's three or four organizations. They've already joined us. We send out flyers and say, write to your congressman. Tell them who you are. Don't just write. Tell them who you are. Tell them, I think this is terrible. I think it's time to change. President Biden cannot do it. When we were put into the Constitution, we were an entity by ourselves. So we have a board of governors. The presidents elect the board of governors. They hire and fire the postmaster general. Nobody else can. Congress can't. The president can't. What we have to do is make sure that the post that we get through to Congress to tell them they're blocking right now Biden's three appointments that would be on our side. They are not letting them through. So you've got people all over the country fighting this fight, but the citizens have to fight the fight. The people who aren't getting services. I was in South Portland last week and some woman came up to me and said, I haven't had mail for two weeks. <laughs> Why? There aren't any letter carriers. They won't go up on their pay, their pay. They won't give them different things. Because what better way to destroy an organization? We're a service. If we're not serving the people, people aren't going to want us. And most of them don't care why we're not serving them. And that's what we've got to bring. That's a movement. Get the information out. Make sure people understand. And it's the hardest thing to do, is making your neighbors, your parents, make them understand what is really happening. That's a movement. Can I help Doris? Sure. Um, last week. This is Pat McKean. Oh, I, I, was the, I have to tell you, ladies, I was the first. Uh, president of the Southern Maine Labor, Labor Council. Council, first woman president. So, uh, but we are in a movement. These two people were out in South Portland last week campaigning for Matt Beck to represent us in Augusta. That's what the labor movement does. My union, I was a clothing worker. Uh, I worked at Heltex for years and years and years. My union has gone to Unite Here. Unite Here is organizing restaurants, organizing coffee shops here, getting people better working conditions, better pay. So we are in a movement. We, we don't, 
stop. I, I think when, and you're both right, and Peter mentioned class consciousness, and mm -hmm. I think that's the key. The movement happens here, and it's not just my head. It, it, it needs to be in a lot of people's heads, and it grows. And, and that's when you know at some point you're in a movement, and it can be a movement that includes you know, postal workers, and, and Doris has done a great job making sure that her membership and, you know, and postal workers in general and, and customers as well understand the situation. And when people understand and connect with each other on that level, at some point. And when you say, when you say here as well, as language that's used, as Peter said, forget about the middle, working class. Working to, class. to hear working exactly. class more and more, that's the type of turn that happens in that's here. Right. And right. now we begin to get a, a different type of move, movement right. language. It, it's our language. It's not corporations. Right. right. It's us. Right. We need to talk. But the one thing you guys can do is, you see a picket. Find out what they're picketing for. If you think you can do it, join us. We are in Bangor on Saturday. It was six below. We didn't take pictures because we didn't want to take our gloves, our hands out of our gloves. It was so cold. But we were there. There were, there were nine unions there representing postal workers. Nine different unions in this state that went up to Bangor freezing to death to represent us and to pick it for this plant that should stay right where it is. Mm -hmm. So, and if you see that, if you see that they're picketing for something, if you see it, we try to get it out on Facebook. We try, everyone, the Southern Maine Labor Council, the, the uh, AFL-CIO, go to their website, see what's going on, see what people are fighting for, because that's the movement. Another important thing is, don't cross the picket. Yes, please. Don't cross the picket line. If someone's is picketing somewhere, and it's not just an informational picket, there's a big difference. If a company is out and they're picketing, and they're out of work to do picketing, don't cross their picket line, please. Well, I'm mindful of time. We're, we're a couple I'm minutes. Sorry. No, 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 we're a couple minutes. Let's give another, another solidarity clap. <laughs> Thanks, thank you, thank you all for for coming. Um, I will I will have some way of contacting each of you through Peter. So if there are any questions, if you wouldn't mind, if folk wouldn't mind, may I get, get questions your way? If there are any questions, you can bring them my way, and I can funnel them funnel them along. I as well for folk out the door. If, uh, if you don't just want one, but you want more opportunities to engage with labor activism, we have a panel on Monday up in Osher um, where we have folk uh, from the Letter Carriers Union, we have May Medical Nurses Union, we have the AFL-CIO, we have uh, a former member of the uh, DSA. Please, please, please come here as a flyer for another event, 1130 on Monday, if you, uh, if you so wish.